Well, welcome to North Shore. It's so good to see all of you who are in this room with us, and I'm so glad if you're joining us online. Welcome. We're glad that you're part of this series called It's Okay to Not Be Okay. And I want to start uh, today by telling you a story about a phone call that happened in a town called Blackpool, England. The call was made by a woman named Cheryl, and the person who answered the phone was a woman named Allison. On the call, Cheryl actually did most of the talking. She was lots of small talk. She was talking about the weather and how spring had come early that year and just kind of casual conversation until she mentioned that just a week earlier, she had turned 81 years old. And Allison responded by saying, 81 years old, that's an amazing accomplishment. Who did you celebrate with? And there was a long pause and Cheryl said, no one. And then there was another long pause and Cheryl said, I was alone on my birthday. And then there was another long pause, and Cheryl went on to say that she had been alone since uh, her birthday and was alone quite a bit before that. In fact, Cheryl said that she hadn't spoken to another human being in several weeks until right now. Here's what's interesting about the call. Allison wasn't a friend or a family member. Uh, Cheryl had called uh, something called the Silver Line. It's a call center for people who just need someone to talk to. People will call just to talk about their day or tell a story from the past or reminisce about something in their life. And the founder of this call center said, they're all looking for this one thing, connection. Just connection. So any guesses on how many calls this one little call center on the west coast of England receives in a normal week? 10,000 calls a week. We're in this series called It's Okay to Not Be Okay, looking at what to do when life isn't okay. And today, we're looking at this not okay part of life called loneliness. I remember one of my first experiences of loneliness in my own life. Uh, my, it was when my parents dropped me off for summer camp for the first time. I was nine years old. We lived in Arkansas at the time, and the summer camp was in this really uh, exotic place called Missouri. And <laughs> I had never been away from home at the time. I didn't know any other kids at this camp, and I didn't know if they would like me or include me or if I'd make any friends. And I remember sitting in the cabin that day, my first day there, and even though I was around other kids, I just felt totally alone. And you see, loneliness, it's not just about being physically alone uh, or whether you like people or prefer quiet. It's a sense of isolation. It's a sense of separation. It's feeling excluded or rejected or on the outside looking in for whatever reason. To be truly lonely is to feel almost invisible, as if the world could just keep going on along without you. And I actually remember trying to call my parents that first night of camp just because I wanted to connect. I wanted to hear a familiar voice, and it didn't end that first night of camp. I mean, I kept calling them whenever I felt lonely until the night when my dad finally said, Scott, you got to stop calling us when you feel lonely. You're 44 years old. you gotta, <laughs> you got to change. You see, no one in our day wants to admit that they're lonely. No one talks about it at parties. No one fills out an online dating profile that says, you know, I've got dark hair, a great smile, and I'm desperately lonely. I mean, no one, no one does that because there's this stigma around loneliness in our day. It's like telling someone that you're weak or that you're broken or that you're weird or something like that. But while no one really wants to talk about it, the reality is we've all experienced, we've experienced it. It can be a difficult feeling to describe, but when you're feeling it, you know it. Maybe you're single and you've been uh, feeling the sense of longing for a relationship for a long time. Uh, maybe you're married, but there's been uh, maybe a growing uh, sense of distance or a gap in your marriage and you're together, but you feel kind of alone in it. And by the way, by the way, marriage isn't a cure for loneliness, for those of you who are thinking about it. Maybe your relationship or a marriage has just emptied, and now you're alone left to pick up the pieces and figure out what to do with your life. Maybe you're in a leadership position at work or in your community, and you feel isolated by the role that you had. Leadership can be a real lonely thing for those of you who lead. Maybe you're grieving a loss could be from moving or aging or sickness or empty nesting. And it's interesting, pain is an isolating experience. When you feel pain, you'll feel loneliness because you're the only person that knows exactly what your pain is like. Maybe you just feel different from other people. Maybe you feel ashamed of who you are for some reason. 
Maybe you struggle to make friends or to trust people. And whatever the source, whatever the reason, the result is this sense of aloneness, aloneness or loneliness or separation or isolation. And here's what very few people will talk about. This feeling of loneliness is incredibly painful. There's actually uh, a study done at UCLA that showed that the feelings of loneliness, get this, actually provoke the same neurological response in your brain as physical pain. In other words, your brain doesn't know the difference between loneliness, loneliness and getting like punched in the face. Like at a brain level, it just recognizes this is painful. And what do we do when we feel pain in our lives? We try to numb it or run from it or avoid it or we make bad choices to try to cope with it. People will overeat, overwork, overspend, overindulge. People turn to drugs and alcohol. People will have affairs or pursue anonymous hookups, all to try to feel less lonely. But what happens is in those choices, as we try to avoid it or numb it or get around it, we just feel more lonely. And loneliness, just so you know, it's not just a risk for making bad decisions, although it is. Some of my worst decisions in my life are made out of loneliness. But it's not just a risk for bad decisions. Loneliness is actually a risk for your physical health. Researchers have found more and more evidence that links feelings of loneliness to physical illness, heart disease, high blood pressure, cognitive decline. When we feel lonely, we become more susceptible to anxiety and depression and substance abuse. In fact, one article suggested that extreme loneliness or social isolation has the same impact on your mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And that's not just a word from your pastor. That's a word from, from a doctor. That's what they'd say. That's just real. And in spite of all the technological advancements of our day and the ease of communication in our day, loneliness isn't going down. It's going up. According to new research published in 2018 by the Cigna Health Insurance Group, most Americans today are now considered lonely. I mean, that's how we're getting kind of categorized by the, by the insurance companies. We're just, they're considering most Americans as classified as lonely. And while some people might think that increases with age over time because people are living longer and longer lives and are experiencing more and more loss or living alone, get this, young people ages 18 to 22 were the most likely to be lonely. And as you get older, or at, I mean, with each stage, it actually gets less and less. Meaning students have higher loneliness scores than retirees in our day, which has led some to call loneliness the next great health epidemic of our time. So here's a question. What do we do? What do you do? Maybe today you're listening right now, you're in this room, and you're feeling a sense of aloneness or loneliness in your life for whatever reason. What do we actually do? Especially if you've been feeling that or wrestling with that for a long time. Well, we're going to talk about some steps you can take, but before we get into the more practical stuff, I actually want to go back and help you see where this need for connection actually comes from. Because here's the thing, it's not something that's wrong with you. So often with loneliness, again, there's this stigma, there's a sense there's something wrong with me, I feel, I feel kind of needy or kind of weak. It's not based out of something that's wrong with you, it's based out of something that's right with you. In fact, if you could travel back in time to the very beginning of human history when God created the universe and everything in it, you would discover very, something very unique about how God made people. When God created the first human beings, he said these remarkable words. He said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Think about those pronouns. pronouns. They're plural. He says, he says us and our likeness, not me and my likeness. You see, God is not some isolated individual somewhere off in the sky. God exists in the form of community. It's at the core of what the Christian faith believes. God exists in the form of community. The theological word for this is the Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that might sound like strange language if you're not familiar with the Bible or the Christian faith, but the main thing you need to know right now is that God is not some individualistic lone ranger. God's nature is rooted in connection, intimacy, self-giving love. God is not alone. God did not create the universe out of loneliness. And when God made us in his image, or better yet, in their image, we took on that same nature, that same makeup, that same wiring. I mean, think about it. Whenever you build or make something, whatever you build or make or write or create, it's always gonna reflect the character of the person who made it, right? 
So if you're more of a perfectionist, everything you made is everything you make is neat and exact and precise. If you're more of a creative type, everything you make is going to be uh, unique or symbolic or different. If you're a procrastinator, you don't know what your work is like. You haven't even started it yet, right? You're waiting to the very last second. To be human is to be made, to be created, to be fashioned, to be formed in the image of a relational God whose nature is rooted in connection, intimacy, and self-giving love. And then after God created the first human being, he put him in a garden called Eden, which just means delight. The man's given freedom, significance, responsibility, and everything up until this point in the story is called good. In fact, the writer uses this word good over and over and over. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. I'd say it's like a broken record, but if you're under 30, you don't know what a record is, so I won't use that illustration. But it's like this broken record, good, 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 up until this point in the story, which means there's no sin, there's no evil, there's no injustice, there's nothing wrong with the world. Adam is content with God, and God is content with Adam, which is when God says one of the most surprising things in the history of the universe. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And maybe you know this story, maybe you've heard this before, but, and you just kind of kept reading, not thinking much about it, but this is a staggering statement, not good. How can anything in God's perfect creation be not good? I mean, think about that, and when you're, while you're trying to untie that one, think of how strange it is that God says the first man is alone. I mean, wasn't he with God? Weren't they in right relationship? Shouldn't that be enough? Well, not according to the God who made us. And it wasn't because God isn't enough. It's because we're made in the image of a God who made us for relationship with each other. Adam was alone until God sent someone in person. Adam was alone until God sent someone in person, which is why we all have, you have this ache, this longing to be loved and to be known and to belong and to be close. This is why loneliness is so painful to us. It's not because of something that's wrong with you. It's because of something that's right about you. I love how one of Jesus' disciples named John put this in the New Testament. He wrote these words, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and then get this phrase, his love is made complete in us. Think about what John is saying here. If we love one another, that is, if we support one another, listen to one another, challenge one another, if our relationships and connections with other people are healthy and strong and loving and whole, God's love becomes complete in us. That is, we're more fully the people God wants us to be. And we more fully experience who God actually is. You see, our spiritual life is directly tied to our relational life. They are two sides of the same coin. And of course, this means the opposite's also possible. When our relationships are suffering, when we carry bitterness or resentment in our hearts against other people, when we isolate ourselves or feel isolated by others, what happens? It feels like God isn't there, doesn't it? We're gonna feel isolated, not just relationally, but spiritually. Think about this in your own life, your own story for a moment. Think about how your view of God has been influenced by relationships in your life that have been hurtful. We all have a story like that. It could be an abusive parent or spouse. It could be an absent parent or friendship. It could be a broken relationship or an act of betrayal. You know, we're meant to be the image of God for each other, and yet so many of us have experiences of being the image of sin or selfishness for each other, right? So no wonder we struggle to trust God. It can be hard when all we have to see is each other. But here's the thing. God has not given up on his hope for relationships. God has not given up on his hope for what community is meant to be or his plan to use community as the vehicle for us to experience his love and grace and joy. My friend John used to always say, it takes people to make people sick, and it takes people to make people well. And one of my favorite pictures of this in the Bible actually comes from the life of a man named Paul. Some of you know Paul was the uh, leader who founded so many of the very first Christian churches. 
And on his third kind of missionary journey, as he's out uh, planting new churches, he's gone through some really difficult experiences, imprisonment and beatings and hunger and sleepless nights. To put it mildly, mildly, Paul is a little bit discouraged. And he's been corresponding through letters with this community in a city called Church, uh, Corinth, um, to a place where he established this church. And these letters went back and forth. Two of those letters are in our New Testament, First and Second Corinthians. And in one of those letters, Paul says this, for when we, when we came to Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. In other words, Paul is not in a good place here. But then listen to what happened next. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by what? By the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. You see, Paul was alone until God sent someone in person. God comforts Paul by the sending, by the coming of Titus, by sending a person, a friend, someone that Paul knew, someone that Paul trusted. And so for the rest of our time, I want to walk through a few practical ways, four actually, that you can confront loneliness in your life, and each way revolves around those two key words, in person, in person, in person. However you experience loneliness, whatever God's calling you to do next, it always involves those two words, in person. And you may not relate to each one of these four things, but I can tell you this, God wants to challenge you or speak to you about at least one of these. So be listening for where God might be speaking or convicting your heart. First way you can do this is this. You need to get connected in person. You need to look for ways to get connected to other people in person. Now this may sound really basic or obvious, but the fact is people who self-identify as lonely have fewer and less meaningful in-person encounters in their day. That's just what the data shows us. Now sometimes this is because we can feel left out by others, But sometimes we feel lonely, we feel this way because we've sort of isolated ourselves, we've withdrawn from community for whatever reason, which is why one of the most effective steps you can take in confronting loneliness in your life is seeking intentional connection. Because the alternative is we end up doing life around people, beside people, near people, but we actually do our life kind of alone. Which, by the way, is what church feels like for a lot of people in our day. Years ago, I met someone at the church where I was serving, and they told me for years, they would come in late, they would sit in the back, and they would leave early. They didn't really know anyone, and this happened again for years at a time. She said, I basically come for the sermons, even the ones you give, which I think was a compliment. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. And so I told her, this church is about way more than the message. It's about way more than a sermon. It's about people connecting in person with people. And that's why here at North Shore, we're not built around Sunday morning services. We're built around what we call life groups, groups of people that meet every week to make sure every week, every person has a chance for in-person relationship and connection. So here's the thing. Here's your homework. If you're feeling disconnected and you don't have a community that you're part of, get in a life group. Get in a life group. We've got a team of people that can help you. We've got groups that meet almost every day of the week. We've got groups in lots of different neighborhoods. And if you're online and not connected, reach out and let us know. We'd love to help you get connected wherever you are. Brings me to a second way that we can confront loneliness, real practical in our life. And it's this, be vulnerable in person. Get connected in person, but then you've got to be vulnerable in person. See, just because you're connected to people or you do life with people or you're around people doesn't mean the loneliness automatically goes away, right? And one of the reasons has to do with all the ways that we tend to hide from each other or put on facades with each other or even sometimes, and this can happen in churches, even sometimes we pretend to be doing better than we actually are. So, you know, at the root of our loneliness, there's almost always something that we're hiding, And one of the ways that you can think about or look for loneliness in your life and the source of it is to say, gosh, what am I hiding? What am I concealing? What am I afraid to share? Could be a secret habit. Could be a struggle that you don't want anyone to know about. Could be a fear that you're carrying that you don't want anyone to see or hear. I mean, I hear this as a pastor all the time, the questions, the fears that people carry. Things like, what if I'm single for my whole life? Things like, what if we're not able 
to have kids. Things like, what if I don't get well? See, hiding, it feels safer in the moment, but it always leads, it always produces loneliness. So here's my question. Who's seeing the real you in your life? Who have you allowed? Who are you letting in to see the real, unedited, unfiltered you? And if you don't think this is okay to do in a church, just go to the scriptures. Just look at the Apostle Paul who would say these wild things like, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, I just keep on doing that. It's a pretty vulnerable thing to say when you're actually writing the Bible, right? I mean, that's a pretty open thing to say. Paul's saying, I don't have it all together. I'm not okay. And when this happens, when we're vulnerable, when we're open, connection happens. Intimacy happens. Closeness happens. Dare I say, healing finally happens. Writer of James in the New Testament says this. Many of you know these words. I've said them numbers of times. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Notice the connection between healing and confession to another person or being vulnerable with another person. See, God cannot heal what you don't acknowledge. Now, here's what's interesting. God can forgive sin, of course, but it takes being with a person to find healing. Do you see that in this text? God can forgive sin, but it takes being with a person to find healing. It takes confession, honesty, getting real, being authentic, coming out of hiding. And as scary as that may sound, do you know what happens when you try this? Do you know what will happen if you do this? When you share that secret, that habit, that struggle, that fear, the other person will look you in the eye and say, oh, wow. You too? Yeah. Let me tell you about how I've experienced something like that or what's going on in my life or how I've struggled that way. If you feel like you're hiding, here's the homework. Here's your assignment this week. Be vulnerable in person. Be vulnerable in person. It's one of the key ways to take a step out of our loneliness. Call up a friend, someone you trust, and say, I want to have a real conversation with you. I meet with a close friend every Thursday afternoon and we have real conversations about our lives, anything, everything that's going on in our life. Because here's the thing, not everyone needs to know everything about you. That's not what I'm saying here. But there should be nothing in your life that somebody doesn't know. Because when there is, when we carry secrets, when we hide, when we pretend, we are walking down a road filled with loneliness and aloneness. Get connected in person. Be vulnerable in person. And then a third way to confront loneliness, forgive in person. Forgive in person. One of the reasons that loneliness is such a problem for people, one of those reasons is because of a sense of separation or isolation that comes from holding on to resentment or bitterness we have with other people. Maybe somebody's hurt you. Maybe somebody's offended you. Maybe somebody has crossed you or gossiped about you or betrayed your your trust in some way. And it creates this gap, doesn't it? The sense of isolation or separation. Sometimes we experience loneliness because we're the person who's done the hurting, right? That can be an even more lonely place to be. We're the person who's done the hurting. Just a quick moment of confession. This is for everyone in this room, those of you online as well. How many of you, by a show of hands, have ever done something that's hurt somebody else? Just raise your hand. Be honest, you don't want to start off your week by lying in a church, okay? <laughs> See, look around. All the hands went up. All the, this is all of us, right? And here's what happens. When we hurt somebody, it creates this little bit of a gap between me and them. Even the littlest thing, right, can create this little bit of gap. And then I hurt somebody again, or they hurt me, and there's more of a gap. And then more of a gap. And what happens is we do all this, t- all this life feeling isolated from the people God's put in our lives because there's sin, there's anger, there's unchecked bitterness, there's resentment, and the way to close the gap is forgiveness. The only way to close the gap is forgiveness. And we have to be relentless about this in our lives to forgive each other in person. I remember a time when uh, some friends invited Nina and I to a baseball game, and Nina had a friend's birthday, uh, her best friend's birthday, on the calendar for that, uh, that night. When I looked at my calendar, I had it on the next night. 
And so I said, of course we can go to the game. And so we did. And while we're sitting at the game, she gets a text from her best friend's husband saying, where are you? We're about to do the big surprise, the big reveal. Where are you guys? And he said, the party's right now. We're going to surprise her. And my heart just sank because I had mixed up the dates on my calendar. And the result was Nina missed something that I couldn't, that really mattered to her. And there was no way I could give that moment back to her. And it felt so horrible. And just this little thing, it seems like such a small thing, but I felt this little bit of a gap. I felt isolated. I felt kind of alone. What's she going to do? What's going to happen next? How's this going to turn out? Loneliness lives in all that. And she looked at me after that and she said these three amazing words. She said, I forgive you. And I'll be in charge of all the family calendaring from now on, but I... <laughs> She, she did, she said those things. But I forgive you. And in those three words, it felt like, ah, I'm not alone. I don't have to carry this alone. I'm not actually by myself. Forgiveness closes the gap, see? Forgiveness brings people close. The only reason we can have a relationship with God is because God is willing to close the gap and forgive he came in the person of Jesus to close the gap, to be close to us. He didn't just take on our sin. He took on the separation, the isolation. He experienced life without God on the cross so that we don't have to. He closed the gap. And if you're feeling a sense of God speaking to you about this, maybe God's put a person or a name on your heart right now. Here's your homework this week. Offer forgiveness to someone who needs it. Ask for forgiveness from someone if you need it. And make the commitment right now because you'll think about it right now, you'll feel some conviction, but you'll get back to your day-to-day -day and we'll get lost in the past. Make a commitment right now to ask for forgiveness or seek forgiveness. It's the only way to close the gap that leads to so much loneliness in our relationships. Get connected in person. Be vulnerable in person. Forgive in person. And then one last way we can confront, confront loneliness, and this is for those of you who may not be in a lonely place right now, but you know someone who is, and it's this, show up in person. Just show up in person. When someone in your life is going through something painful, don't send a text, call them, go to their house, show up in person. When someone's in the hospital or grieving, don't just send a card, drop by and see them, show up in person. When there's someone in your office or at school who's going through a difficult time, reach out, show up in person, take them to lunch. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to solve all their problems. You just need to reach out and show up. The writer of Psalm 68 wrote these amazing words. He said, God sets the lonely in families. Isn't that a great verse? God sets the lonely in families. And that's what the church is supposed to be. It's a family, a home, a place for lonely people to find belonging. And there's nothing that says family like just showing up. And we just got through, uh, you know, October and Halloween and early November, which means it's Christmas season, right? It's already started. The trees are out and the songs are everywhere. And holidays, everybody's clapping for that. That's kind of amazing. Holidays, they can be a hard time, right? It can be a lonely time. But there's this thing about family that can be such an interesting bridge to that. Family, they're just people who show up at your house. Even if you don't want them to show up at your house, they're gonna show up at your house. God sets the lonely in families. It's not about being perfect. It's not about having it all together. It's about being together. I remember in one of my lonely, lonely seasons, just to be a bit vulnerable with you, one of my lonely seasons of my life was about a decade ago. I was single. I was struggling in my work. I was experiencing a ton of self-doubt in my life at the time. And it was my birthday. And I hadn't planned anything, and I, hadn't, I didn't really answer the phone when people called to reach out about it. And you know, one of the things we do when we're lonely so often is we push people away. We just push people away. And I had done that. I'd actually gone to a Giants playoff game by myself that day, as if to say, I'll just be alone, I'll be fine, I don't need anybody. And then I got home, and I turned off my phone, and I went to bed early, and I was just laying there, kind of, kind of soaking in my own frustration and loneliness. And then there was a knock at my door. And at first I didn't get up. I thought, you know, they'll go away. It's dark out. They'll leave. It's fine. But they just kept knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And finally I got up and I was pretty frustrated. And I was going to tell whoever it was to just leave me alone. And I opened the door. And it was a longtime friend and mentor of mine who had come into town to see me. And he could tell I was kind of a mess and I'd been in bed. He said, he said get up, Scott. We're going out to dinner. 
and he wouldn't take no for an answer. He showed up when showing up is the only thing that would have worked. And here's what's so cool about that. That's what God does for us. He showed up when showing up is the only thing that was going to work. You see, we were alone until God sent a person named Jesus who came into the world and is knocking on the door of your life right now, and he'll keep knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking until you're so frustrated you say, what do you want? And he'll say, get up, we're going out to dinner. You and me, in community. It's kind of interesting, on the night that Jesus was arrested, the day before he gave his life for us on the cross, he did this really cool thing. He brought his friends together for what? A meal, dinner, at a table, together so that no one was alone. He took bread and wine and said, this is my body and my blood that I'm giving for you. It's really interesting. We call this meal, this dinner table, communion. It's about connection. It's about intimacy. It's about forgiveness. It's about being placed in a family. God sets the lonely in families at a table and he invites you and me to this table together. And so we're gonna receive communion today and as the elements are passed, here's what I wanted you to do. Don't take them yet. Just wait for a moment. We're gonna take a moment and take them all together as a way of saying no one at this table is alone. No one's doing this by themselves. No one has to go it alone because when you're at God's table, your family and when you're in God's family see when you're in a place like this you're never alone so let's pray Jesus we bring so much of our lives before you today doubt and pain and brokenness but in the midst of all that we also bring deep loneliness to you and aloneness to you God, I know in my life uh, so many bad decisions came from this place of just feeling isolated or rejected or excluded or ashamed or alone. But what an amazing picture we have of you stepping into our world, showing up in person when we needed you to show up. And so God, we're thankful today for your grace, for experiencing the loneliness of the cross for us. But we're also grateful, God, that you've called us together. You've set the lonely in families, that we get to be part of a family today, that we're at your table right now, side by side with each other, that we can experience through your grace and redemption the joy and power of connection and love and belonging and closeness with each other as a way of experiencing you in our life. And for those who are here this morning and just feel desperately alone, God, I pray, I pray right now that your presence would be felt so deep and that today, this morning, or this week, that you would show up for them in person, through a person, as you always do, reminding them that they're loved, that they belong, that they're invited to this amazing table of fellowship and friendship with you. Jesus, thank you for coming in person into our lives. And we pray this and we receive now our place at your table together. And everybody said, amen.